I'd like to uh, just give a little heads up where we're going. Some of you are familiar with our studies. We are looking at basic fundamentals of the Bible. That's what we were studying uh, this, this spring, and I'm excited about our study today. Uh, worthy of worship. It's a, it's a build on what we studied last week, law, legalism, and love. As we get started, do you mind just bowing your heads with me in prayer? Father, I recognize it is your spirit that must speak to us this morning. We pray for your Holy Spirit to explain the word of God. Teach us, we pray in your name, amen. Worship is important. Yes? In fact, it seems that most people have to worship either something or someone. Uh, did you know that 84% of the world's population are affiliated with some kind of worship? And the Pew Research Center suggests that that number is going to only increase over the decades. While scholars and static statisticians, I actually looked at that and tried to figure out how to pronounce it properly, statisticians, they offer many reasons why. But there's a professor, Bible professor, named Norman Gulley, and he's made a statement that I think is clear. Humans are worshipers. This stems from their creation by God. They were made for God. If they do not worship God, they will worship something else. This is why religion is found in every culture, however primitive or advanced. Humans are designed to seek a center to life in order to give it meaning and security. Simply put, humans are worshipers. They were made for God. You were made for God. You were made to worship. So, what about this worship? Do you mind turning with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4? In fact, I might actually, I have it on the screen. You're welcome to turn in your Bibles as well. I'll, the first two texts we're looking at today are going to be from the book of Revelation. What does the Bible say about worship in this last book of the Bible. And, and the reason I'm bringing up the last book of the Bible because that's the book that tells us about what's going to be happening in the end of time, specifically. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 is describing the scene around the throne room of God, and it says this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So this is the basis of theology for worship. How's that sound for a nice, exciting term? Let me put it simple. Worship is creator, created beings, worship being a creator. Simple. Worship is created beings honoring, valuing their creator. We humans have it all backwards. Because we, the created ones, worship what we create, which is inferior slash inferior. Right? But that's not worship in the Bible. The Bible is the created being worshiping the creator. Um, all right. Revelation chapter 14. It's a message that's supposed to go to the entire world. Uh, right before Jesus comes. Do you realize the word worship or worshipped is found 24 times in the book of Revelation? It's, got, it's a key issue. In fact, uh, in this passage we're about to look at, in Revelation chapter uh, 14, starting with verse 6, this section talks about two kinds of worship. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7 talks about one, then Revelation 8, 9, 10, 11 talks about another kind of worship. In fact, quite simply put, it's two. Worshiping the creator versus worshiping an end time power called the beast. But let's look at it. Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth and to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. So there's a, there's a message that's not going to one denomination. 
It's not going to one culture. It's not going to one section of the earth. This is a message that's going to the entire planet. It's worldwide. This message is not made for a specific set of people. It's made for all people. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And then it says this, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. So when I I see this this passage, again, there's this call to worship a creator. Revelation talks about worshiping not just any God, but the creator God versus worshiping a creature, the beast. Interesting enough, that's the choice that the book of Revelation will ultimately give as we study it through. But that's not our focus today. We're just looking at this concept of, of worship. All right, both places talked about creation. Both talked about, uh, one specifically used the phrase and uh, worship him that made heaven and earth the seas and the fountains of waters. We're going to look at that phrase a little bit more, but before we do, let's look at creation. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Yes? Genesis chapter 1, and let's look at verse 1. We are looking at creation, the creation story. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it starts. The earth was out, form, and void. It goes through. Okay, a little bit of test for my, the Bible knowledge. You ready? Day number one, what was created? Light, that's right. Day number two, what was created? Firmament. We, we could use the word only atmosphere, right? Day number three, what was created? Land, land and plants, that's right. Day number four, what was created? Sun, moon, and stars. Day number five, what was created? Sorry, I guess I shouldn't give illustrations, right? Birds and fish. Day number six, what was created? Yes, I'm assuming you're all saying the right thing because it's kind of become a little bit Babylonian-ish here. You know what I mean? Confusion. (laughs) Sorry. So you have creatures, land creatures, and humans created on the sixth day. What was created on the seventh day? Nothing. So we go through and we see light, firmament, land, sun, moon, and stars, fish and fowl, animals and man, and then nothing for that final one. Uh, Just a a few points. Um, It seems to me, as I read it, that creation was creating a place for humans. God created a world, then the last thing he created was humans so they could enjoy the world. In fact, he actually put them in charge of the world. You see that. So it's a very special thing, this creation. Because the creation wasn't just God saying, oh, let me see uh, today. Bum, 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 fish. Okay. That's not how God did it. In fact, if you notice how he did it, first three days is, is creating space. The next three days, he's filling that space. It's a great, very systematic in how he works. God's not picking and choosing. He's creating something very special for the last part of his creation, which is humanity. Something very special. If, I don't, if you don't mind me saying so, this planet wasn't made for dogs. I love dogs, okay? But it wasn't made for them. This planet wasn't made for birds. This planet was made for human beings. The creation was for us. This planet exists for us. Because the creator God wanted to create a place of beauty. Sin has changed things, has it not? But the goal was a beautiful place for you and for me. You know, as um, I'm looking at this, I read about worshiping the creator in Revelation chapter 4, 11, and Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. And then when I look about the creator, I find out that there is a day connected with the creation that's a little special. Please notice Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Now, um, I always find this interesting. It's not like God had a great workout in the first six days and had to take a break on the seventh day. That's not the issue. 
the resting was a cessation of work so that he could spend time with the creation. Notice this, verse 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it or set it apart. And here's why. Because in it he ceased, I'll use that phrase, from all his work which he had created and made. God blessed the day. He sanctified it or set it apart as a special day. A day to spend with his creation. Beautiful picture. Day one, God blessed it. No, no. no. Day one, God created and said, it is good. Day two, God created and said? Day three, God created and said? And you read the story, it goes the whole way through. But when he gets to the seventh day, something's different taking place. And we can't miss that. The day is, is not a normal day. All right, the language. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7 said, And worship him who made heaven and earth to see the fountains of living waters. That is actually taken directly from the Old Testament. Remember when we studied Revelation, we've been going through Revelation slowly, but Revelation is taken, more than 50% is taken in whole and part from the rest of the Old, from the Old Testament. So let's look at Old Testament. Where is that phrase found? It's found in the place of our study last week, the Ten Commandments. So Exodus chapter 20, if you don't mind turning there with me. Exodus chapter 20. And verse 8. Exodus 20, verse 8. God has gathered all of his children of Israel. He's removed them from their slavery in Egypt. He's brought them out as a nation. And the first thing that he does is they're organized. He meets with them. They've built a sanctuary. Even before they build a sanctuary, he speaks to them with his own voice. And then he writes with his own finger some very special directions for his people. And they are called the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20 and verses 1 through 17. Smack in the middle is this one. Remember the seventh day, the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it thou shalt not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Very interesting and almost arbitrary. I hope you're following with me. Okay, here's the day. This is the day you can't work. Now, this is frustrating because sometimes when you say can't to somebody, that's what they want to do it, Right? Maybe you're not like that, but I am a little bit. You tell me I can't do something, I'm like, oh, really? Right? And, and, and so when we hear can't, it's sometimes, but can, can we look at it from a different perspective? This is a day you can rest. Oh. You can cease going into the office. You can cease going to your work. You can cease having to study. Amen. And this is a day you can rest. Oh, I can take that. What a beautiful way of looking at it. But it still sounds arbitrary command. Until I read verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters, excuse me, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, Therefore, the Lord, what's that word? Blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Oh, so this is a different kind of day. It's not God just saying, oh, let me just pick something out of the sky. That's not how God's working. He said, I have set this day apart already, long before the Ten Commandments were given. It was set apart a long time ago. It was a day for worshiping me in honor of my creative power and for me to spend time with you. That's the picture. So that is what we see here in the fourth commandment here in the Bible. Um, Who said the Ten Commandments? Who spoke the Ten Commandments? God did. And it's interesting enough, this is the one thing in the Bible I actually wrote by himself. He wrote with his own finger. I'm longing someday to see what the handwriting of God looks like. Or the finger writing of God, let me put it that way, right? Uh, Longing to see it. All right. Oh, did I, uh, 
sure enough, it's, it's amazing. Um, I'd like to look at our next point here. Before they got to Mount Sinai, something special took place. Uh, God realized that his people didn't have, he didn't realize this, he knew this, they realized they didn't have food. And he said, okay, I'm going to provide food for you. That food was called manna, uh, which means what? What is it? They had no idea what it was, so they called it, what is it? Um, and so they're eating manna. They get it. Manna comes every day. Your goal is to pick as much as you can eat for that day. You should not save any of your manna till the next day, because if you save your manna to the next day, what happens to it? It spoils. It goes bad. And so you keep it. Every day you go out. But then something different happens. And the Bible describes this. Actually, no, it doesn't. The Bible does describe it, but my screen doesn't describe it. You ready? In Exodus chapter 16. Could you turn there? Exodus 16. And we're just going to look very briefly at verse 29. Exodus 16 and verse 29. It says, See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place and let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So something interesting happened. It came every single day. And if you kept it to the next day, it went bad. But on the sixth day, that's right. You got extra. You're supposed to collect extra. So that means God must have put extra out there. And then I keep that extra and put it in the back. And if I had done that the day before, it would have gone bad. But when I do it this day, it stays fresh, brand new. How long did this happen? For 40 years. For 40 years, God told them, here is the seventh day Sabbath. They knew it because God was doing it every week via a miracle. It's awesome. Uh, sometimes you ever wonder if people, how do they know? Well, God told them. Um, it's kind of, a, it's, a, it's a neat thing. So there's a passage in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 32, who tells us a biblical principle. Now this is speaking about what we would call a special uh, a yearly Sabbath, but it also applies to every day of the week. In biblical thinking, from even to even, or from evening to evening, is when you celebrate a day. From evening to evening. So that means tonight at sunset, or evening, Sunday begins. And how do I know that? Because the Bible tells me a Genesis in the creation week, and evening and morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the second day. And God's thinking, he starts out with the evening, finishes with the morning. And that's what's taking place here. So help me out. When did Sabbath begin? When did this Sabbath begin? Last night, right? Last evening, this Sabbath began. And that's just a, a biblical principle here. Uh, when you're applying the Bible to your life, you need to use the principles of the Bible to do that application. And this is how to do it. All right. And here's a picture. Sunset. You go to sunrise and sunset. And that would be a solid week. Now, creation is, is, is memor uh, memorialized in the seventh-day Sabbath. But the seventh-day Sabbath also tells us about something else very special. Do you mind turning with me to Ezekiel chapter 20? Ezekiel chapter 20, and we're going to look at verse 12. So uh, while you're turning, um, maybe you can't do this because I'm struggling doing it right now. Uh, doing two things at the same time. Can you tell me why you're turning? What is the purpose of the seventh day Sabbath? It's to remind us of what? Yes, yeah, seventh day Sabbath reminds us of a Sabbath. And what, what did God do in the Sabbath? He rested from what? From his creation. So every Sabbath, I'm remembering what? He's the creator. That's right. But I like this passage in Ezekiel 20 because it kind of expands the creatorship of God. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. It says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who does what? Sanctifies them. I like this because it tells me 
that when I keep the Sabbath, I'm to remember that God has done something in my life. You know what we call that? Recreation. See, what did, what did, what did David pray in Psalms chapter 51 and verse 10? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. When I see the Sabbath, it's not simply a reminder that, hey, we have a creator and we did not evolve from pond scum. Right? When I, I see this day and I'm celebrating, I'm also remembering that Jesus Christ came into Chuck Holtry's life and said, this is a mess. I want to do something better. Right? He took out the heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh. That's a reminder Every Sabbath, God's the creator, not just of this planet, but of something new in me. What an awesome thing. I I honestly, I think that if we remember this, I'm speaking to myself, if we remember this point, Sabbath would become even more special. Uh, Someone also said it's a rest, not simply from physical labor, but from every kind of labor. It's a reminder that it's not of my own strength that I am saved, but of his grace that I am saved, right? It's a rest from me spiritually trying to slug it out and say I'm good enough. We looked at this last week, right? But Sabbath is beautiful. It is a beautiful, beautiful picture. All right, so what about Jesus? How did Jesus look at the Sabbath? What was Jesus' connection with the Sabbath? He kept it. It was special. Yeah, let's look. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Probably one of the more uh, familiar verses on Jesus and the Sabbath. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he, Jesus, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Jesus lived to 33 years old. He kept the Sabbath for all those years. And some will say, well, Chuck, he he was a Jew, and Jews worship on Sabbath. It kind of makes sense that Jesus would also worship on Sabbath. It's interesting to note that he actually never taught people to do anything else. In fact, are you ready for a little bit of a shock? Matthew chapter 12. Can you turn there with me? Matthew chapter 12. And we are going to look at verse 8. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8. Jesus is speaking here. And he makes this statement to some Pharisees who are rebuking him. He says, For the Son of Man is what? Lord, even of the Sabbath day. Wait, who's the Son of Man? That's Jesus Christ. That's, that's one of actually his favorite titles for himself was the Son of Man. He loves to identify with you and me. So he, he said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Oh, if Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, then that means the Sabbath is the Lord's day. If Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, then that means that Sabbath belongs to him, the Lord's day. So when you look at Lord's Day, we're looking at the Sabbath. Uh, Kind of a beautiful thought, isn't it? So to see how powerful this was. Do you think any disciples heard Jesus saying this? Yes, he was with his disciples when this happened. He says he was with his disciples walking through a field of grain. So his disciples with him, they heard him say, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. They knew the Ten Commandments, which, which says the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So they knew that Lord's Day was connected with Sabbath. Many, many, many years later, about 60 years later, you have an old disciple. He wasn't old when it all started, but he's old at this time. And here's what he says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Here is John, the beloved disciple, the one who Jesus loved. He remembered what Jesus said and taught. And he said, I got this vision on the Sabbath. 
I got it on the Lord's day. So if you're ever wanting to, uh, the, to see the beauty of the book of Revelation, it was written on the Sabbath. At least part of it was, right? That first vision for sure. All right. Jesus, at his death, did he keep the Sabbath? Now, I, I find this very, very important. If you don't mind turning with me to Luke chapter 40, uh, 23. Luke 23. Jesus... I can't use the word workaholic, okay? I could describe some of you in here as workaholics. You may not like that, but I could probably say that, right? But, but, but we can't call God a workaholic. But I ask you a question. Does God ever stop working? Okay, just, I'm just, just saying, okay? Jesus has been with God from time immemorial, right? Always carrying out the will and bidding of the Father. Did Jesus ever stop working? Yes. Are you ready? Are you ready? Luke chapter 23. I love this. I'm sorry. That, I, that wasn't, wasn't kind. I didn't mean that in an unkind way. Luke chapter 23. And let's look at verse 52. Speaking of Jer Joseph of Arimathea, it says, This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then he took it down. That's Joseph of Arimathea. He took down the body of Jesus, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. Brand new tomb. No one ever been there before. That day was the preparation, right? And then what does it say? The Sabbath drew on. So the day that Jesus died on the cross and was taken off the cross was called what day? Preparation day. Those of you who are familiar with our understanding in Christian history, we would call that good Friday, okay? We have that picture. And then the Sabbath is coming on or coming closer. In fact, in King James, it's New King James, it says it drew near. Let's continue. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. But because it was, it doesn't say this, but this is the picture that's coming out here. They prepared it, but they didn't put it on his body. Here's why. They rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So we have the preparation day, Good Friday, and then we have the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now let's look at chapter 24, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and other women went with them, came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. They prepared it on the preparation day, had rested on the Sabbath. Now they're bringing the spices to put on his body, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Why? Because Jesus Christ was no longer in the tomb because they serve the God of the empty tomb. He's no longer there. That's the God you and I serve. What day did Jesus resurrect? According to our understanding of Christian history, the first day of the week called Sunday. In fact, sometimes people, people even use the phrase Easter Sunday. It's not a phrase, phrase you'll necessarily hear me use a lot of, but I have Friday followed by the Sabbath followed by Sunday. Please tell me which day of the week is Sabbath? Which day of the week is between Friday and Sunday? It's Saturday. Saturday is the seventh day Sabbath. That is the day that the disciples rested. Very clear. So what about, oh, oh, so here's the point. Jesus, was he doing something when he laid in the tomb on that Friday, Sabbath? He rested. Was he healing that day? No. Was he preaching that day? What was he doing? He was resting. Our creator rested. The one day in all, all, the, all the universe of time that Jesus rested was a Sabbath. It's a beautiful thought. Uh, because his work for saving you and me was accomplished. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Jesus stopped after the work of creation and stopped after the work of redemption. I wonder if there's going to be eternal Sabbath in heaven. Maybe so. We will rest when everything's done. All right. Did Jesus want his disciples, though, to keep the Sabbath after?
after the resurrection. I mean, maybe because he resurrected on Sunday, God said, you know what? I would like you to keep that day. Did he want them to keep the seventh day Sabbath after the resurrection? He did. Some of you are saying yes. Some of you say, okay, where is that at? Well, let's look. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is speaking in Matthew 24 about the end of time. He's talking about all the events that are going to take place about the sun and moon and stars. He talks about nations angry with each other. He talks about the love of many waxing cold. He talks about the place that you and I are living today. But he's also talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which we know historically took place in AD 70. What year did the destruction of Jerusalem take place? AD 70. Jesus died in the year AD 31. So 39 years after Jesus' death, was the destruction of Jerusalem. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 24 and verse 20. And pray. He's speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem. He says this. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. I realize I'm not taking the context. Please read the context. It's clearly about the destruction of Jerusalem. Pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For 39 years, from the resurrection of Jesus until the destruction of Jerusalem, God's people prayed a specific prayer. You know what they prayed? God, help me that my flight will not be on the Sabbath day. That meant they were observing and keeping it holy. For 39 years. No change. If you look at the early church, uh, it is fascinating. Um, Uh, and Sabbath keeping in the early church. Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 18, 16, 17. In fact, the book of Acts could be called the book of the Sabbath. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of times the Sabbath is being kept, spelled out in the book of Acts. Uh, Sometimes it'll say, and they kept the Sabbath, and they were there every Sabbath for a year and a half. So, okay, that's how I'm extending and getting some larger numbers. But amazing. Uh, Let's look at one. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 uh, do you mind doing a little, a little run through the book of Acts? Let's, let's see. Can we do it in five minutes? I had some people, family members. I hope they're listening right now. It wasn't my wife. Who said, man, Chuck, you were long-winded last week. So I'm just, yeah, this week's a little bit longer. No. Ch- Hold on. Let's, let's just look at this. Acts chapter 13. Oh, did I? I jumped ahead of myself. I did. Who's had a birthday recently? I want to emphasize I have not touched this. I'm not even the one who wrapped it. Okay, so this is fairly clean. Who's had a birthday recently? Yes. Oh, I, I see you have. See, could you pass that to somebody? Yeah, I'd like to give you a gift, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it uh, right here. Mm, mm, mm. If you can come forward, Mr. Eugene, I am. No, no, you, you need the cake. I need the cake. Uh, when, when was your birthday? Today's your birthday. Oh, that, see, you just messed up the illustration. I can't do it with you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. I feel terrible now. Terrible. (laughs) Who would have thought someone's birthday was today? (laughs) Mr. Eugene, my apologies. Someone whose birthday has been near to today, but not today. Can I see someone? Anyone? Yes, ma'am? You just know there's a cupcake with it. Miss Florine, can I? And I will, can I do this? When was your birthday, Miss Florine? January 14. You know, a birthday of someone like you, ma'am, I think we should commemorate it 
and change the day. I think we should make February 6th your birthday. Okay, everyone in agreement? Anyone? In, okay, we've got some agreement. We've got some agreement. Okay, so we're going to start a tradition here, okay? Could someone join me? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Miss Florine. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. We met together as a church family. Please don't miss this point. We've met together as a church family. Many of us decided that we were changing Miss Florine's birthday to February 6th. We actually sang a song, and we're in a church. That means it's changed. How many of you would agree with my logic? No one would agree with my logic. You see, you can't change the day when Miss Florine was born. That's impossible. But we did it in a church, and we sang. That doesn't make it a reality. Because humans can't change the time when another person entered our world. Neither can humans change the time when God blessed our world. If we can't change a human day, what makes us think we could change a God day? Yes? Is it, I can guarantee you that you probably are not going to look at February 6th next year and say, ooh, I'm so glad it's my birthday. There's no way. Everyone's going to call up on January 14th and say, happy birthday. God looks at things the same way. He's not thinking, oh, okay, let me enjoy this day of the week or this day of the week or this day of the week. He says, the seventh day is the one I blessed and made holy. That's the one I'm meeting on. I mean, I love you all out there, and if you want to worship on another day, I mean, I guess that's your choice, but the reality, the one that I blessed is this one, and you can't change what I've done. I think it's important for us to realize. So where were we at? We're going to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13 and verse 42. It says, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Wow. So Jews and Gentiles are both worshiping on the same day. They're worshiping in a synagogue. They're worshiping on the seventh day Sabbath. It says that they begged that these words might be preached to them to the next Sabbath. Who begged? Was it the Jews or the Gentiles? The Gentiles were begging. There was going to be a meeting of Gentiles on the same Sabbath that the Jews worshipped the next week to hear the preaching of Paul. What a beautiful picture. Um, and by the way, you can see this throughout the book. Um, chapter uh, 17, verse 2 talks about it. Chapter 18, verse 14, talks about, about the same thing. But I like to look at chapter 16. 16 and starting with verse 12. 16 and verse 12. So, uh, Paul and his group have gone to Philippi. Philippi was a city in Greece um, and is a city in Greece. And it was in Asia Minor. It was a new place they would go to. And when they got there, I'm not sure of all the reasons, but there was no synagogues to worship at. Maybe the, no synagogue existed in that city, although I kind of doubt that. Maybe it was that no Jews wanted them to worship with them. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Okay? But notice what they did. Did they say, okay, since there's no synagogue to worship at, and let's just go choose another day. Look what it says in chapter 16, verse 13. And it says, And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was wont to be made, as it says in King James, or was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Wow. 
There may not be a church, but it's Sabbath, and I'm still going to worship God. Uh, Some of you have had that experience in the last 10 months. Am I right? Some of you haven't been able to be to a church. Some of you who are watching online say, you know what? I just haven't been there for various reasons. Did the Sabbath still come and go? And for those of you who are here now who weren't here a lot of times, did you still worship? Right? We still worship. Sabbath is still Sabbath. It's not connected to a building. It's actually connected to a day. And that day was blessed and sanctified by God. You know, um, I ask myself why. I have an acquaintance of mine. I'd say friend, but he's too famous, so I have to say acquaintance, okay? Um, He served in the Special Forces of the United States Army. Uh, At one point, he was Drill Sergeant of the Year um, for the U.S. Army. He became part of the Delta Force, became a sergeant of the sergeants, and in Black Hawk Down, he was one of the backup crew in the sky waiting to do whatever needed to be done next. Uh, Just an incredible man. I, I met him after this. He has seven children at the time. He has seven children now. And uh, that kind of life was kind of rough. You know, you, you could be at the base and you just call up your wife and say, hey, sorry, I've I'm, I'm, I got to go. I'm going on an assignment. Do you know when you're getting back? I have no idea. And so his wife lived with a lot of uncertainty. And as you can guess, she did a lot of the raising of their family. I'm not going to get too much into it, but he has told us, uh, those of us who would come and spend time with him and listen, he said, you know what? I feel bad for what my wife has gone through. And I wanted to make it up to her in some way. You can't make it up, but you want to at least start with a better, with a better slate, of, right? He says, so here's what I'm going to do. I am spending one day a week, every week with my wife. We're going on a date. It's date time. One day a week. Now, uh, those of you who have young children like me, we can just kind of smile at such sweet dreams. But the reality is, he said, I'm going to make it a priority. And uh, he, his, his children were older at that time, uh, and so they could watch the younger ones. He had a, a large span age-wise. And then a little bit later, he said, you know what? I want to go even more. I've decided that one weekend a month, I'm taking her out. And I remember him describing him doing this, his love for his wife, him wanting to show her, I love you. you have, I want you to know how special you are to me for all that you have done. And so he spends that time every single week with his wife. You know, we have a, a God in heaven who wants to do that with you and with me. I love them. You know, not only, not only is the Sabbath a reminder that I, I made them, but they're mine twice because I, I, I bought them back at Calvary. They're mine. I want them. And so, This day, which sometimes just seemed like another day in the week to us sometimes. I'll speak for me. God looks at it and says, I love them. I'm waiting for them to be with me on the day that I've made special and holy. It's a special day. I have a question for myself and for you, and that is, do I want to have that kind of special experience? I do. I'd like to look at one more text. Would you mind turning with me to Isaiah? You know, God likes spending time with us now. (laughs) But once we get to heaven, he's not going to want to spend time with us anymore. You disagree, right? I I was waiting to see. No, no, God's going to always want to spend time with us. 
He loves spending time with his people. You know, there's a... Now, okay, if you're talking about unconverted humans, right? There's a reality that some of you say, hey, we like you, Pastor Chuck, but if you had to spend any time with me, you might say, "Mm, not as much. And and it could be that way for any of us uh, because, let's, let's face it, sometimes seeing a person and living with a person is two different things. And when we get to heaven, we're going to be living with him. But he's going to want to because there's this, he's done a miracle in our lives and we're with him. He's going to want to spend time with us. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66, starting with verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful picture, yes? It says here in verse 22, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And he says they're going to remain before him. They're not going. The old heaven and the old earth actually did pass away. They will pass away in the future, right? They're going to be gone. But the new heavens and new earth isn't changing. It's staying. Nahum says, affliction will rise, not the second time. So this, this is a whole new thing. And then he says, so also your descendants and your name will remain. And that means your names remain and you're not going anywhere. You'll be spending eternity with God. And then it says this in verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. We will have special days to come together before God. New moons. I always have fun trying to cipher that one out. But we will also have from Sabbath to Sabbath. You know why? Because the Creator is still there. And we will still honor Him because He is worthy of worship. Our creator God will never cease to be worthy, and so we will never cease to worship. Amen? Let us pray. Father in heaven, I want to worship you in heaven, and I ask, Father, that you would stay with me And not just me, Father. I'm asking for my brothers and sisters here this morning. We want to draw close to you. We want to have the experience of heaven. We acknowledge that you're worthy of worship. And we worship you today by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.